So most of the presentations here were about some fairly astounding big world problems that were being solved. And so part of my role of being in this slot is to reflect back also on some of the things we heard today, but also to say, you know, why I think that there are these signs that your data, and maybe not just your data, but your data stories are telling you that you have graphs, that not only are graphs everywhere or graphs eating the world, but that your data knows that. So I'm Karen. So I'm, my name's Karen. Thank you. So I also tweet a lot and do some other social media things because part of my advocacy as being not only a data chick, but as someone who wants everyone to love their data. And I think one of the ways that we love our data is by making sure that we're providing the right homes for it, that we're providing the right tools and techniques for it, and all of those things. So some reflections on today. I don't know about you guys, but the stories and the demos I saw were fantastic. How did you feel about that? Yeah? I mean, it could be any data story, pretty much. Someone could be showing me an Excel spreadsheet that they created in third grade, and I'd think it would be wonderful. But also, and in case you were just got off a plane with no Wi-Fi, in other words, you flew Air Canada because we don't have a Wi-Fi on Air Canada much, you know what today is, right? It's back to the future day. And one of the things that Emil talked about in his opening keynote was about the parallels between where we are with graph databases and graph processing with where we were when relational databases were becoming new. So anyone else experienced enough to have lived through relational databases being discovered or invented? Some of you just don't want to raise your hands to admit that. How many of you are just people who don't raise your hands when the speaker asks you to raise your hand? Excellent. You're in the right meeting. So some of the things is that what really, and I sat out there in those beautiful yellow chairs, and I thought about how the stories we heard were really about changing the world. I mean, yeah, that's kind of really exciting, Pollyanna, but I'm also a cynical Pollyanna. I'm, I'm known for my snark on Twitter. One of the things is, is that when I look at, you know, we're talking about how graph databases are influencing world leaders, I think that's going to change the world in some way, and it's not just, okay, they're not supposed to hear me say this, but it's not just because it's graph, it's because I think data is going to be changing the world. We're already seeing indications of that, and every year that I survive another calendar year, I know that data is changing what I have access to, better decisions I make, all of those things. Um, Monsanto told us about a new circle of life that involved genotypes and how those things are going to change the world and some really important problems with feeding people and taking care of each other. And then we heard about how investigative journalism, how the use of being able to discover and derive and visually see the connections between data, how that allowed investigative journalism to do a much better job and to also share that data in a way that was much more consumable than a bunch of spreadsheets with a strict format that wasn't easily consumable. And also the visualizations made it easy for non-technical people to work with it. I thought that was great. And we heard about more visualizations and more about um, food traceability and how Lending Club put together a MacGyver-like package and how exciting that was, and how we're overwhelmed with documents and being able to basically find the metadata and the tags in those doc documents and increase searchability and findability of documents without you know, getting just uh, hundreds and hundreds of pages of search results that don't really apply. Any one of these things could be directly changing the world, or they could be just providing the tool set that you and your organizations can change the world. The other thing I felt was fantastic is that 
because I'm experienced enough, because I have been through that pre-relational world and the relational world, the other thing that has changed for me is this concept of contributing work that you did to solve really big problems to an open source. So giving it back to the world, and we saw lots of examples of organizations that have solved some tricky problems and are committed to sharing that with other organizations. I think that's fantastic. But why graph? So you guys have sat through these things, you're working with graph databases or you're graph database curious, but why? Now I have some kind of snarky and some maybe contentious opinions about why graph database, why thinking about graphs is important. I actually think, no matter how many people are big fans of hierarchical ta taxonomies or applying structure to the world, I actually believe, based on my decades of experience playing with data, that there really aren't a lot of true hierarchies. And by true hierarchies, that's not a technical term. I mean a tree hierarchy, where something has exactly one parent. Those don't really exist, and we spend a lot of time in developing systems or designing databases where we want to pretend, sorry, where we want to pretend that our data is a hierarchy. I mean, HR org charts are hierarchies, product catalogs we think are hierarchies, and one of the problems we struggle with is that by trying to enforce that view of the world on our data, we actually make it harder on ourselves. So a typical hierarchy. So let's say you have a friendly bank in Bedford Falls, and you own this savings and loan, and you have these people reporting to you. And that's all fine and dandy until you realize that people who report to you aren't, that isn't the only relationship they have to you. So you can see the hierarchy on the left, and then a greater hierarchy on the right, where not only are people reporting to each other, but they're married to each other, and they're related to each other, and they might assist and report to directly or supervise any of those things. We try to put all of our data about people into hierarchies, and people just do not cooperate with that. Have you found that to be true? Right? The same thing's true for items and products and departments and parts and facilities. We try to put structure in our world and we try to do that through the data in our solutions and we end up suffering a lot for that because, you know, you see this reporting structure but then there's always a dotted line. And there always is. And then people will give you business rules, like you can only hold one job position at a time, and yet we end up having people shadowing other people or overlapping other people. You guys have run into these stories before, right? And then you go back to your ERP or package vendor and say, but we actually need to have five people filling this position, and two of them are primaries and the rest are secondaries, and we don't know what to call the everybody else, and they say, but it doesn't work that way because you can only fill one, you know, you can only have one person in a position. Like, no. So in the relational world, like Emma talked about how the relational world that we struggle with these things. Now, one of the things I didn't say in my introductory slide, I come from team relational. I work with relational databases, I work with transactional system. If we put together a flag football team right now, I'd be on team relational. That's what I do with most of my life. I'm a SQL Server MVP, I, I'm a data modeler, I do ERDs all day. I'm telling you, I dream in data models that are highly relational. But that doesn't mean that I think relational database systems are the solution to everything. So here'd be a typical way that someone might set up that purely hierarchical reporting structure in a table. We'd have employees, they have a name, they have a title, and then we point back to their one parent, right? This is how we did it, this is how you guys learned how to do it in that one, no, you didn't learn how to do it that way? This is how I was taught to do it. But then we have these problems, is that of course people can report to more than one person, and what do you do with the person at the top? Well, there's all these workarounds, you might create a dummy record, you might have the CEO reporting to the CEO. We do these tricks with our data, 
even when we think it's hierarchical, even the purely hierarchical implementation has issues. And so in the relational world, that would be a recursive relationship to say that employees report to employees, right? Except that what we learned is that's just one relationship of employees to each other. There's probably a hundred other relationships of employees to other people. So we end up with these highly recursive, self-referential uh, joins, heaven forbid that word, that we do in a relational database. The other problem has is what happens when, if we're doing a departmental hierarchy, what happens when we add a new level of middle managers, or we take one out, or we need to move all, half the people from one manager to another? We can do all this in relational. There's blog posts on how to do it. There are scripts on how to do it. There are tools on how to do it. And yet, it's messy when we try to do it this way. So we have these tricks in the relational world for dealing with both hierarchies, which I already told you, they're not really real. There are a few exceptions that are. Or how we deal with these relationships between the same entity to another. We might have special data types. So in the SQL Server world, there's an actual data type called hierarchy ID. And it is designed to store a path of all the hierarchy for things that are related to each other and it's really fun to play with and it does all these nifty super pet tricks with hierarchical data. The only problem with it is it doesn't perform well at all at any real world scale other than a very simple structure and that's because it's doing a trick in the relational database. We can set up adjacency lists, um, we can put a column in that does path enumerations. We can create closure tables that do all this path analysis and nested sets. Anyone implemented any of these in the relational world? And did you actually have to go write a series of documentation to explain to everybody how all these tricks work? And it does work. And the reason we have to do it in the relational world is that relational databases and their underlying foundational assumptions is that the data is optimized for write and that the data follows a very strict structure. And that's not a failing. You go to a NoSQL conference and people will tell you that's the failing. No, it's a feature and it's the reason we build things in relational databases. The data story for most of the data that has a fit for it deserves to be there. Having said that, we have this other problem of dealing with highly flexible and very important relationships, not just foreign key constraints. And we implement those things, like I said, as a relational database. But we find out that this hierarchy really isn't a hierarchy. It's really closer to a network or bill of materials, materials type structure. And that means that we don't go build a special relationship in a relational database. We do what? We create another table. And we create that table, and that's an associative entity that takes care of our many, many, many to many relationship between employees, and we stuff it full of data, and we're all good. Except now we've introduced a whole other set of problems for dealing with this many to many relationship. And I won't go into all of them there, they're just a trade off. But it means that we transform something that was really a relationship into a table, into a data item, and we treat it just like any other data item. And because we've done that, we have to do all kinds of special processing and querying around it, and also take care of a bunch of anomalies that we could accidentally introduce by doing this other trick. So. One of the things, one of my key observations, with apologies to the Buddha, is that all data is suffering. What does that mean? So, not an expert in this, but my general understanding about this noble truth is that we suffer, and suffer just means deal with, stress with, have a pain point of, trying to fit things in our world into a belief system or structure for which it really doesn't work and we have no control. That's kind of stretching the truth a little bit, but basically our data suffers and we suffer and our business users suffer 
because we're trying to force some data and some queries into a world for which it was never designed to be and we are gonna suffer and our data is gonna suffer, all those things are suffer. But one of the things, one of the key points about dealing with a graph and our data in a graph is that in the relational world, foreign key relationships aren't relationships at all. Remember, the relational database is called that because the tables are relations, not because of the lines between the boxes or the circles in our diagram. And they are constraints. They are actually physical, they are the seat belts we put on our data to keep it from going out of control. They are not the relationships that our business users talk about that we think about in our lives. That's why in the relational world we have to create them put them in a table before they're actually a thing. The other thing is our relational database, we can't put properties and tags or labels onto those relationships. Sure, we can give them a name in the database, but no one sees those. The important thing about graph is that we've put the relationships as just as high or higher priority to the nodes or the things in the graph database. And then the other thing is, is that relational databases don't scale well when we're doing these relationship graphy like or pathy, I call it, like queries or understandings. So in my sample graph database, I always go to the Scotch one because, well, it's Scotch. So I said, relational databases aren't about relationships, they're about things that just have constraints between them for data integrity. And I think this is the most misunderstood difference, why we say certain data, or more importantly, certain questions are a better fit for the graph. A lot of the discussions that I go to at events or people I talk to, they want you to choose an either or, which do you think's better, a graph database or a relational? And that's not even, a question that I can answer because I want to know what questions do we have. So the relational database focuses on tables and the graph database focuses on relationships and certain questions we have for our business are really more about the relationships, either discovering them, documenting them, or even understanding that there are relationships between things and it's a classical trade-off there. So why do I think that your data is telling you it's a graph? Well, so first of all, your data is telling you a graph if you're calling it that. So that some of them are true and some of them are outright lies. A network, I said a hierarchy, almost all hierarchies really aren't. If it's a tree, if we have multiple taxonomies about something, if we talk ancestry or structure, if people are, if humans are using those words to talk about, you know, an organizational chart, a reporting structure, a network topology, it's telling you the data itself and the relationships between it are important. I think if you're using those database tricks to make it feel like it's graphy, so we heard from speakers about trying to implement it in a relational database, and then putting a layer on top of it to make it look graphy or feel graphy. That's what we've all done with our, relation, uh, our relational structures. And it's not really just relational, hierarchical structures. So remember, I'm experienced enough to have been pre-relational. We had hierarchical databases. We have hierarchical structures in other database formats like XML and JSON and any of those. Those are hierarchical. If your software vendors are telling you, we just can't do that in our package, that's usually in our solution. That's usually because they've designed something in a way that assumes a non-graphical, a non-graph database or graph processing stance and now trying to put that on in a layer after the fact or onto a commercial product is just not easy to do. I think it's also if your questions are pathy. So this is one of the things. I think it's more common to say that we need to have a graph database and graph processing because our questions are graphic, graphy, not so much because our data is. 
So data can be, especially the structural stuff, but the important thing is, is what questions do we want to ask for it? So when you learn about query languages in general, because it's a demo, because it's a presentation, you, you see these really simple relational query things like show me all the orders in their order lines. That's a great way to learn structured query language or learn about relational databases, but those aren't the hard questions we're asking of our data these days. We're asking the forensic or the anti-fraud ones, which says, how many times did someone who knew this person three levels out ever visit this postal station and ship a box, you know, from this to this country? We can actually track that data and answer it in a non-graph database, but it's going to be very expensive and it's going to take a long time to run and there's a good likelihood that we'll have to stand up a completely separate solution to do that that is designed for specifically for that question in order to optimize getting those answers out. Then we end up not having the budget for that or the skills for that. I think we have done a lousy job as analysts and architects even asking our business users, you know, what are your more advanced questions? We don't even do that as we're building transactional systems. I think one, because we're afraid of the answer, and two, because we know we might not be able to provide that service. And that's because all data is suffering if we're, we've only got a relational database for these things. So it's not just an eightfold path in your data, it could be 100 paths or 100 nodes or thousands. I think another way your data is telling you as a graph is if the IT team is saying, that's just gonna perform slow, we can't do it, or it's gonna impact other systems, or we need to build a data warehouse, or I don't think we can answer that one. That might be a tell that what we really need is the right tool for this. I think you aren't asked, if you're not asked, able to ask your data some of these questions for that reason, your data could be a graph. But here's the number one one. You build a proof of concept in Neo4j and it just works. And that's what I hear over and over again is that we built a proof of concept, but it wasn't our old school proof of concept where we put a rapid prototyping thing together and did some code first stuff in .NET. You actually build this proof of concept and then in theory, your underlying data model's done, your whatever visualizations you're gonna put on it, you're using that already, is that you're able to prove that your data's a graph or your queries are a graph just by doing the proof of concept. So we've heard throughout the day lots of case studies of when graph databases work best. So anytime there's any question of recursion, of just things related to the same type of thing going on for an infinite number of times, potentially, with a very ragged set of answers. Like one person might have three followers and the next person might have 100 million followers. That's the social media one. And the Kevin Bacon problem and organizations related to organizations. Master data management. So most people don't think of master data management as being a graph issue. I think it's totally a graph issue. Um, product lines and product configurations and customers, all of these are graph, not just data, but graph questions always. We heard examples of networks and IT operations. The ultimate graph is the IT systems that I work with every day. So assets, identity, uh, bill of materials, who's using what, where it's located, all of those things. And real-time recommendations, we hear about that. We've heard about those today. But not just recommendations, but finding out that we have dots that are connected and we don't even realize it. So a lot of the competitive advantage stories that I'm hearing about are about being able to ask your data those questions that to tell you what are the graph parts of your data. Also, forensics and fraud, that's the most exciting thing because, you know, CSI and all these other modern things that are happening. Um, behavioral patterns, how do people act, when are they not acting like they used to. 
that could be both someone doing something bad or it could be someone walking through your local retail store, any one of those things. Resource optimization, this is where I think, if you're on the IT side, this is where we could offer our organizations lots of savings and risk mitigation to be able to say, what's the shortest path to get there? Where are things? Where are the hot spots? The, the servers that are being underutilized? The people who are overscheduled? Anyone fit into that one? People who are underscheduled, don't raise your hand. There's also examples of people doing promotions building, like building retail promotions that will lead to more purchases and renewals or targeted offers, offers, things that we haven't even thought of offering. I told you as a data modeler, one of the things I like about the graph is that there's not this logical, physical separation, that there's just a data model, an underlying data model to it, and that the actual graph you build is the data model and the database. They, we can do whiteboard data modeling where we can just draw up circles and put nouns in them and put relationships between them and actually walk with all kinds of levels of people, whether they're business people, C-level people, managers, other IT people, all of those things are exciting to me. Now, here's another contentious thing. I think our traditional entity relationship data models still have a role here. It doesn't mean we'd be generating graph databases out of them, but we have, in some companies, decades of understanding, at least about our current data, about what it looks like, what the exceptions are, the properties of it, the various labels we have for it. We can be contributing that to a, a graph implementation. The key for me in being able to do graph processing and actually query things with almost no limitation as to the path that I can take through it is that I could just start at a customer level and just keep going through. On a traditional relational project, I will have a defined scope and if I have to go do something really expensive, chances are that will be agile, backlotted, parking lotted, backlogged until someday, whenever someday comes. So real world use case. One you haven't heard about here is Polyvor. Anyone a young fashionista? No, me neither. Oh wait, you're a young fashionista? <laughs> a young fashionista, that's their target market. Not me, and I still am excited about it. So Polyvor allows young fashionistas to go clip pictures along with their underlying metadata from websites and combine a whole bunch together and make a pretty image that they can share and then people can like. So it's basically crowdsourced compiling of outfits or combinations or special features along with all that metadata. See, I'm a data person so the metadata is making me happy. And that can tell both a vendor of these products, a manufacturer of these pro products, how does an end consumer, someone who is focused on fashion, how do they want to use and buy and put these things together? And then, of course, it allows you to do the usual things of social, of liking, of commenting. It's basically someone putting together a virtual web store of a bunch of people's products as if they owned all the stores in the world. That's how I think of it. And there's the usual things of badges and contests and everything. And this seems kind of frivolous, but this underlying relationships of products, their metadata, how they're used together and what people use, what people think of them being used together, and then manufacturers and vendors being able to interact with that and run contests, I think that's really exciting. And, and the ability to do this and then go mine all that data, a lot of value. There's telecommunications and retail organization use cases uh, that um, can really talk about influencing consumers to take an action. So in the old school days, we came up with advertising and that way of influence. But I think once we're able to do more targeted marketing and to be able to figure out how to optimize packages and promotions, that's really exciting. So we'll go back to this slide, is I think changing the world with data, if you're a data person, that's exciting. 
but also with a graph. So I encourage you to go back through some of the case stories that were filmed, were recorded and reported on today because they're exciting. I'm also, I said that master data is a graph and part of the reason is, is that I can go ask all these important questions about customers, but I can also do the deduping of customers, not just based on syntax, like how is my name spelled and what phone, one of, what of the dozen phone numbers I have do you have on hand for me, is that we can also look at other patterns behind that to do more queries about all of the ways I've interacted with you to try to figure out if I'm that same customer. Because we want to have this 360 degree view of data, but it's not just the data. I want people to be able to ask those questions, the questions that we couldn't afford to ask before. So some tips, you go read about graph databases because the books were free for download, taking the courses, then going and talking to key business people about the questions they'd love to ask about their data, other ways they can love their data that they've been told, no, we can't afford to do that. Then there's also a paper about relational databases and the graph. I think what I strive to do is to help business users understand that there could be relationships in their data that aren't currently documented in their relational databases because we've told them the relationships are just those constraints between each other. Instead of reminding them that that data we have in different databases or in different tables still might have a relationship. So installing and playing with NEO, definitely important. But I think being able to quantify the insights that you can take with existing data is the first step to helping an organization understand how to get more insights through new data, external data, or new questions. And then the fun with graphs that I love to go play with. Uh, so it should not shock you that the second most favorite one for me is the Belgian beer one. So also fun to play with. And then I also wrote a white paper about why your master data is a graph. I told you that was one of my favorites, so I'm biased, but I would recommend that. And that's all I had for today. And so I think we have a few minutes for questions if anybody had any, because we have a mic. Anybody using master data solutions with Neo? No? Oh. Right over there, perfect. Is it for beer or scotch? <laughs> I think so, beer or scotch. Um, I have a question about implementing data that's in a already in a relational database into a graph um, database. Uh, is that something that's, is there best practice for doing that? So you're or? talking about data that's currently hosted in a relational database, is that what you said? Yes. And yeah. then you want to move all of it or part of it? Sure, like all of it or just try, yeah. try something new with a graph database. <laughs> <laughs> so definitely trying something new. I mean, that's easy and affordable to do. The other thing is, I mean, I hate to use that it depends thing. But I encourage people not to think of just migrating away from relational, but to think about data, where it should live, where its best home is, where the best fit is, and then also thinking about um, the types of the graph-like questions you'd ask of it, and then letting that guide you to be what should live where and at what time. Thanks for uh, making the point about the importance of uh, having your relational and your graph side by side. Um, extending that, would, would you uh, see any use cases where RDF would be appropriate in addition to uh, relational and graph? Right, so do you mean RDF-based graph databases or just RDF from the semantic world in general? Uh, speaking of, the, to the, the former, um, just looking at the, the limitation with the uh, 
the, the triple uh, yeah. pattern instead of the uh, property-based uh, yeah. format of Neo. Right. So I'm a big fan of semantic technologies in general and RDF in general. And I do think it's another version of finding the best place for the data as well as for the questions you have. Um, I think like uh, just like when we had initial relational databases, there were lots of ways of implementing that back it, decades and decades ago when I was six. Um, but that it really is about understanding, not just picking a technology, but understanding the problem you're trying to solve. Um, you know, I'm all for, because I'm all about the data and not the database, I'm all for polyglot persistence, but not as a collectible pattern, meaning I just want to have one of every type in my shop. Uh, and I think that sometimes people look to technologies, especially some of the newer NoSQL stuff, because it, they get to do away with thinking about the hard problems. So, you know, we could go back to common delimited files. Oh wait, that's Hadoop. But we could go back to that and, and that would free up some of our time, but would it be the trade-off that we need? Um, so I guess the answer is it depends again, sorry. I think that's it. I'd love to talk to you uh, probably on Twitter because that's what I do a lot of. Um, so if you want to tweet me or actually talk to me in person, you could do that because I think there'll be time for that this evening as well. Thank you.